Hey everyone, uh, if you're watching this video, it's a recording of a presentation that I've just given earlier this afternoon. Um, that session wasn't recorded, so I'm just going to be using the same slides uh, to talk about it. And the point of doing this is for anyone that attended today, um, it can be shared with colleagues, co-workers, or if you've stumbled across it and find this interesting, then obviously you can watch it. Um, I'm going to be using the same slides. But at the very end, I'm going to be using the questions that were asked in that session um, and answer them in this video as well. So we'll make a start. There's a couple of slides that don't make quite sense, so I'll skip over them. So I started with, and I will start with the same thing, which is if you happen to be watching this video, thank you. Um, thanks for making time. We're all busy, right? So um, the fact that you carved out some time to watch it, I genuinely really appreciate it. Um, the words on screen. Uh, were hello from people that were attending the session across the world. Um, so if hello isn't in your language, um, then we'll consider it should be added. Uh, my name is John Rhodes. I am one of the founders of a research design company called Paper. Uh, I'm a delivery manager and user researcher. I'm not a university researcher, but I have worked with plenty over the years. And I think the slides that I'm going to be talking through today are possibly different to what you've seen before. And I think the language and methods that I've been using um, are probably different to what you might have seen in the past too. I've tried to make these slides interesting and engaging and wherever possible I've tried to use as few words as I can on screen but there are some slides which do have quite a few words on them. I didn't make any assumptions about the people that joined the session nor am I making any assumptions for the people that might be watching this video so I'm going to do the same thing which is read out most of the words on the slides. Um, some of you might be relying on my voice words. I'm going to ignore a little bit of housekeeping and how to ask questions in the session. But I will start here, which is I'm going to cover five things in this uh, recording. First is an introduction to paper and the background to the study. This, uh, this video is about a research project. I'm going to talk about how that research was planned and conducted. And by doing that, that makes it easier to talk about what we've learned and when we share what we've learned, the insights. The fourth is uh, some tangible things that we could all do to act on this research. And then the fifth was um, was making time to answer questions, but I'm going to use that time in this video to answer the same exact questions that cropped up um, in the live session. Um, and it might last about an hour. So PAPER is an independent education research and design specialist. Um, we've been around since 2016 and been trusted by universities, UK government and large organisations to conduct high quality and highly ethical research and design. We've worked with over a thousand students, head teachers, support staff and universities in that time too. I mentioned that so you know that uh, you can be confident we know what we're doing in this space. We set up the business um, using four key principles. They've guided the business from day one. And they've also in turn um, helped make it really clear about what our purpose is, why we exist. And that's really simple. We conduct research to understand the problem that users have. And in the context of this project, this video, those users are students. And we design services that meet those needs of users. And we include people who struggle or might be excluded on every single project. And we've done that on every project that we've ever done at Paper, and we'll do it on every project that we ever do when Paper exists. And we do that because those three words that are on most of these slides, every user counts. We care deeply about people. We strongly believe that every single person, every user does count. Throughout this um, talk, this video, there are five of these section break um, slides. Um, I see these as dark green background with some white text on them. The first one is an introduction to the project. And I'm going to talk about the inspiration for the project and where the idea for the research came from. And you can see in the top left hand corner, it gives an indication of how far along we are. This is the first part of five. So I took this picture uh, a little over eight weeks ago at a conference here in the UK. At the conference with the Association for Learning Technology Conference. This picture was taken on Wednesday, which is the second day, the middle day, a session early on in the morning uh, where students were talking about their experiences of uh, starting university. I found it quite moving and quite powerful because these students were talking about 
feeling isolated and vulnerable and scared and lonely and embarrassed um, and it really resonated with me i i immediately wanted to hear more <clears throat> and I actually immediately had an idea as well um the conference was held both in person and remote and for each a tool was used a website app tool was used um where people attending could ask questions and those questions could be updated and the screen on the background the white screen where the text is too small to read um shared those questions and one of those questions on that screen was this how would you like education to approach generative ai and i'm not for one second saying that that is an important question i just couldn't understand how anyone would want to ask students about that when they just talked about feeling isolated and lonely and vulnerable and scared i felt like no one else in the room was listening and it made me have an idea and that idea was this I wanted to run a diary study for students starting life at university. This was a paper funded, so no university commissioned this work, commissioned it ourselves. And I wanted to understand from students themselves how they were getting on. Speed is a thread throughout what I'm talking about today. And this is an indication of part of that. I took that picture that I've just shared on the previous slide a little before half past 10 on that Wednesday morning. And a little over half an hour later, I had a guide, a document ready that I could have shared with some participants. It had enough information there to document and detail the study. And it asked some follow-up prompt questions that I wanted to repeat every week. And I mentioned that because I want to show the speed that we have to work at, at times at paper. And the reason for doing that is we work quickly and iteratively. We get something out there might not be 100% perfect, but it's good enough and we'll learn from it and we'll iterate rather than waiting for perfection. And the question that I wanted to answer was this, do universities meet or fail to meet the needs of students? I know that universities are doing some really, really great work. <clears throat> this came through on the study and I knew this beforehand as well. But what I wanted to do was look into and delve into those good things and also look for where things weren't quite right, maybe where things were falling through the cracks. This is what I wanted to look into. So a second section is around planning the research. And this is talking about um, the timings for the research, how it worked, how we planned it, the recruitment of students and the methods that we used. And this is the second section. So from that um, picture that I took at the conference, to the start of Freshers' Week at most universities here in the UK was 16 days. And that is either um, not enough time or a perfect amount of time. It almost made it a binary decision. I either got stuff sorted to make sure this happened or I lost the opportunity to do it. And I was really, really keen to do it. So I just had to make it work. I wanted to share some words about the study and these are my own words. <clears throat> I wanted this study to be the words of students um, completed in their own time. I didn't want this to be a burden, another thing to worry about on their weekly basis. I wanted it to be something that was almost enjoyable to do. We use Google heavily at paper, and I've used it before to run diary studies, and it's worked really well. And we know that we can use Google documents because they don't need an account, uh, an app, a sign up of any kind. It's just a document that can be accessed via their email address. And when I say Google document to anyone watching this that maybe is unsure what that is, think of it as the same as a Word document, um, a, a blank place where you can write, uh, type stuff, share pictures, share videos, that kind of thing. And we restricted access to documents so that they were private, personal documents for each person, restricted only to that participant and the small team at paper. And if participants shared that document with another person that would have flashed up and meant we could have locked it down as well and we asked for a minimum of 30 minutes time each week that felt like the right amount of time to get a lot of useful stuff out of participants and we asked for no more than 60 minutes time as well because i didn't want this to be a burden and for every week completed <clears throat> we provided a 25 pound incentive voucher and it was really important this was a weekly study i didn't want this to be something that students felt like they had to carry on doing sometimes things happen and if a student wants to drop out of 
the study after two weeks. I wanted that to be absolutely fine. I didn't want them to lose out on any incentive vouchers. Uh, we ran the study for four weeks and we had an option to extend for two weeks, um, which we enacted with some of the students. And we created time and space um, each day to, I said, encourage participants. Um, it was encouraged, but it was also supporting students as well. And I'm going to talk about that support a little bit later on. So now we needed to find people to take part. And we did this two ways. We did online recruitment and also in person. The online, um, I was really happy with how this went. We got a nice spread of people attending universities across the, uni uh, across the UK from a variety of universities. And I also wanted to test myself on this project as well. Um, and testing myself for this was doing some in-person recruitment. So the middle picture is a flyer that I designed quickly. I made it colorful. I highlighted the paid research. I included a QR code. And then the picture on the right hand side is myself and Cam. Cam's in the white t-shirt, attending some local-ish universities and handing out these flyers on the Freshers Week. And that combination of things did exactly what we needed it to do. We had too many people sign up than we had space for in the study. Another thing on speed is we have a number of patterns already in existence of paper that really help when we were working on something to this speed. Um, things like the register interest form and the consent form and the incentive form, they already exist. I just needed to take the thing and tweak it slightly and then it was ready to go. That really helped. I'm going to pause slightly here and because it feels like the right place to talk about and this is how we deal with ethical research and how seriously we take it um like i said we've been in existence paper's been in existence in 2016 and we've been managing research data and using ethical and informed consent since day one and um, before the study started we created a list of um, key services for each of the universities where students were taking part in case we needed to sign those people to them and we had to signpost people to them, I should say. We have worked with universities across the years and we know about the ethics processes and we use that as a guidance and a reference tool throughout this project. For example, I included my own peer reviews with colleagues at paper at stages throughout this work. We are trusted controllers and data, joint controllers of sensitive data for government departments and also large organisations. And we take that governance really seriously. And when I say sensitive data, I mean, really sensitive data like pupil level information. And then the final one is we're a team of mental health first aiders. Uh, we're trained on conversation with vulnerable people by the Samaritans. And we also each have had anti-racism training. Um, I've had to use my mental health first aid training on this project. And sadly, I've also had to use the anti-racism training as well. So, like I said earlier, we had too many people um, sign up to register interest than we had space for on the study. So we had to select people to invite them to take part. And we use this four criteria. The first is any conditions or disabilities that impacted a student's day-to-day -day life. And we did that, if you think back to that slide earlier about our purpose, and I was talking about people that might struggle or be excluded. That's the reason we do that. The second was uh, we were looking at the universities that people were starting at to try and get a spread across the UK. Third was the home location of students, including international students. And then the last thing is we were looking at where people were living during that first year of university. So halls of residence, shared accommodation, um, living at home. I mentioned before we, we've done diary studies um, over the years for quite a lot of people, and we've really refined this process. We know that keeping it simple is difficult, but also really important too. So all communication was done via uh, email with the students and that pointed people to their individual Google document. People completed um, the document weekly with some prompted questions. And if they did that weekly, that um, meant that we could send them the incentive voucher. But that document wasn't um, just a standalone document. It was effectively a tool to have a conversation and an interactive conversation with people. It meant that people could write something and then we could ask a follow-up question and then we'd read some more information, we'd ask some more follow-up questions. It provides a really nice way of delving in something time and time again. This is an, a number study, um, anything like that. This is about delving into something and getting a really clear understanding of it. 
So this next section is about sharing what we've learned. These are going to be the words of the students, and I'm also going to talk about how we group them and how they've been broken down too. Just a, a few words about user research. What I'm talking about here is user research. It's not market research. It's not survey information or anything like that. This is about delving into something and asking really detailed questions and following up on those questions and really getting a good understanding, a deep understanding. And we do that again because every single person counts here. Yeah. I've had to start somewhere, so I'm going to start with this quote. Um, you'll see uh, in the bottom left hand corner is a reference number. That's a participant number. Uh, and this student said, I felt less alone and more like everyone else in that everyone else was struggling with the work. And I've used this one because uh, it's almost counterintuitive that someone felt better by being surrounded by other people who were struggling. Not a nice feeling, is it? So for this section, I'm going to break things down into these six categories, these six broad themes. I don't think that these themes will be a massive surprise to everyone, but they are academic, social, health, settling in, accommodation and finance. And what I'm going to do is take each of those six individually and I'm going to share how it's broken down into subgroups and sub themes. Then I'm going to share some quotes that are relevant to each of those sub uh, groups and sub themes. Then also throughout this section, I'm going to be sharing some questions, some pondering type questions that I've had, that the team at Paper have had as we've been doing this work. So I'm going to start with academic. It breaks down into these three subsections. The first is around understanding assessments. This is where students are understanding how the assessments are marked, how the work is different to what they're used to, and they're working out the vast range of percentages for the modules and courses, often in their heads, often on the fly. The second is around balancing workloads. This is where students are worried about balancing time for lectures and assignments, reading, course material, and also paid jobs. Each of them have fixed deadlines. They have immovable deadlines. And then the third is around academic support. This is where students are struggling to understand where people are getting support from with their academic studies. And before I move on, you see in the top right hand corner, there's a smaller graphic, smaller image of the previous slide. That's just to show and give an indication of where we are. So this is the first one of the six that I'm talking about. So this student said, since I got to uni in particular this week, I felt like I'm perpetually behind. Another said, I'm quite glad to have so much contact time, really, because I struggle more with independent work and keeping myself on track. So this is a challenge I'll have to tackle, as it's worth 16% of the module for the year. And then someone else saying, I'm feeling anxious about not achieving the best results and uncertain about the marks I will receive. So these have made me think of this question, uh, which is how can students arrive to university feeling more prepared for what's expected of them or what's to come. Again, I don't have the answers to these questions, but they're certainly questions that I'm thinking about. The next section is social, and it breaks down into these two. The first is being part of something. This is really nice. This is where students are finding or enjoying finding groups, exploring new locations and building a support network and feeling proud of putting themselves out there and feeling proud is echoed in every single document. There is a flip side though, this is where students are struggling with social commitments. They're worried about getting to and from social events, struggling to balance trying to make friends with university work, and the mental health is impacting on their ability to socialise. So we have one student here saying, next week I plan to try a new church. I had put it off as I had no one to go with. But, um, but now I'm creating bonds with people on my course outside the educational setting. I really liked reading this one. This is someone that's almost plucking up the courage to do something they've been putting off. It's really nice. But the same person also said, this week I'm feeling mixed emotions. Things are becoming more like a routine, which is good, but due to my depression, the social side of things is still exhausting. Next section is health. It breaks down into four subgroups and they're across the next two slides. The first is mental health. This is where students have feelings of overwhelm, anxiety, worries, depression and anger. 
and how this is impacting their lives at university. The second is around balancing health and academic work. This is where students are feeling exhausted from workload, making themselves ill and pushing themselves through the illness rather than resting. The third is around managing health. This is the tactics that students have for managing diagnosed health conditions. And the last one is around university support. This is the descriptions of how supported a student has felt at university with a diagnosed health condition. So with this uh, participant saying, this week I've been particularly stressful for me. I'm grappling with an overwhelming amount of information to absorb. I have late evening lectures, online skills development courses to complete, personal reading to prepare for an upcoming phase test and assessments to submit. I think anyone watching this can probably emphasize that's a lot of information to absorb and do, probably too much. But then we also have this student saying, the labs team have also been brilliant about my disability, as has the whole university, and I've never felt so supported before. For example, in the a type of lab, there was already a stool there for me and I was allowed to have it at my workstation if I needed a break. I really, really enjoyed reading that one. To hear that someone has never felt more supported and to tie it down to something, including a stool, is really, really lovely. But then we also have someone else saying this, I don't like this change in my own attitude towards it, it being moving rooms because I can't really do shit about it. So I just end up listening to angry sound and music and walking around campus slash town longer than I need to. So my question, my pondering question for this point is, how does a university know when to check in on a student? How do you check in on someone that's never felt more supported and is in a really good place? But also how do you check in with people that aren't in a good place and that are walking around town and campus listening to angry sound and music because they're not in that place? Again, I don't know the answer to this. The next one, so this is about halfway, is settling in and it breaks down into five sub themes across the next two slides. The first is acclimatising to university. This is how students deal with the jump from A level to university and how it's felt. That's the students getting used to talking in seminars and learning how university works in the real life and learning about the spaces of each university. The second is around access to support. This is learning about their own coping mechanisms for if they need help. And the third one is around feeling like home. This is the little things that make a big difference, like food from home, fresh flowers and hot water. The next one is travel and getting around. This is students understanding how to get to and from accommodation to university and struggling with public transport and finding the best place to buy affordable items in their new locations. And the last one is preparing for the second year already. This is worrying about where they're going to be living next year and feeling the pressure of choosing a house and housemates just a few weeks after starting university. So this student said, preparing and savouring my own local dishes alongside enjoying consistent access to uninterrupted electricity and hot water has added to my comfort. For context, this participant is an international student. And I know when I read this, next to a nice warm radiator and drinking a bottle of water, I um, immediately stopped moaning about whatever I was probably moaning about. This next quote is, as long as you seek for help when it is needed, most things should be fine. I've included this because the word should and fine uh, next to each other in the sentence are pretty scary for me. And then this last one is, the number X bus diversion makes it very inconvenient for me to get, which is frustrating as it requires me to walk up the hill. With my condition the way it is, some days this is much harder than it is. So this question um, is, how can universities do more to support students with disabilities or health conditions? An ultimate section here is around accommodation. Breaks down into these two. First is a productive space. This is creating a space where students can do work and feel comfortable without being distracted and how students cope when this isn't possible. And the second is around accommodation support. This is the stu support students uh, available or not. Um, and what, I'll read that again. This is the support available or not to students when they're having problems with where they're living. And again, got some more quotes here. 
This first is someone saying, my maternal grandma has come to stay for six months and has taken my room to sleep in. If I want to use my room for its desk and a more comfortable work environment, I have to do it when my maternal grandma is awake and isn't praying inside. And then the second one is completely different. This is someone saying, your flat mentor works for a name of a service and should be your first point of call for any issues. Every so often, your mentor will check in on your whole flat. For example, mine popped in yesterday. They sent us all the same email and just asked for a quick reply to make sure we're all okay. And from that, you can see the vast difference from where people live in and the support they're getting. So a question here is, is a university any less responsible when a student isn't living in student accommodation? Final section is finance. It breaks down into these three. The first is university financial support. This is the advice students need on how to set up a bank account and what monetary support the university can offer them. The second is around budgeting. This is learning how much everything costs in reality, how long their money is going to last them and the unexpected costs they've already had to incur. And the last one is around working while studying. This is the difficulties of finding a job which can be easily done alongside academic commitments. So I have one of the students saying, even though I've only been here for a month, this week I have extreme worries about my financial situations as a student. Living on your own and paying for everything with no help from your parents is really expensive. I'm not really enjoying my job either, which is the majority of my funds, but there's nowhere I can resign either. It's hard reading this one. Never nice hearing that someone feels like they're tied into a job, but they need to stick at the job to earn money to pay for the stuff. And then this other one is I can't actually remember whether I personally knew I would have to save for a house deposit, but I know for certain there was no information given about this from the university. I think most people watching here can emphasize that learning about a house deposit is quite a crucial thing to learn and know about where they need to keep the money from. So final for now, pondering question is, how can universities support students to make financial decisions whilst they're studying? We know there's information before a student starts university, but what about um, whilst they're doing it? This slide here is taken from a tool that we use to analyze uh, research like this. The blue um, post-its are the six broad themes. Uh, and the bluey purple color post-its are those sub-themes. And the reason for including this, I've described everything as if it fits neatly into six boxes and little boxes underneath it. And in reality, it doesn't work like that. These arrows on screen here show that one thing is very loosely connected or very um, quickly connected to something else, often more than one, uh, one other thing. Uh, I should say at this point, I want to thank Rachel at Paper for all your help um, with the analysis work. Everything that I've talked about so far and everything I'm going to talk about has just come from five participants and they've shared um, just over 18,000 words via documents. So hopefully that's another indication of the level and depth of information that you can get from research like this. Throughout this research and study, though, there's been a, almost a darker undertone. These are the things that if a co-worker, colleague or a loved one said to you, or wrote to you in an email or sent you a text or WhatsApp. These are the sort of things that I think you probably want to check on them and ask how they're doing. And I've done this because not everything fits into those six boxes that I've talked about. Some things fit outside of this, but it's really important to talk about this. I'm just going to read them out. So the first is this week was kind of forgettable. I doubt I'll remember the events of this week after today. And this week, I haven't had the most productive mornings, so I hope next week I can sort my sleep and eating schedule to stay healthy and happy. And this week has been tougher than normal and a bit overwhelming because I've been ill and missed a few lectures. I have to do all my normal work on top of the catch-up lectures. And some days I felt exhausted after returning late from lectures, only to have early morning classes the next day. Moreover, there were no numerous assessments to submit. And I haven't been able to tell anyone about it since all of my old friends are busy with their own uni stuff and God forbid I get pissy with my parents or else I'm the bad person. And there's a relentless stream of lectures to attend. I'm going to share one more slide relevant to this and it's just cropped up this week. 
So um, I'm sharing what I can um, and I'll talk through it. I wanted to add this in because I want to show how you can see how someone writes, not just what they write. And this is taken from directly from what a um, participant has put in their guide in the document um, just this week. I've taken it, literally copied and pasted it into this slide. I have um, replicated those red squiggly lines. <laughs> for everyone, that, for anyone that's used a Google document or Word document or email, if there's any grammatical or spelling mistakes, you often see these red lines to highlight it. So whilst those red lines have been added and designed in by me for this slide, they're exactly in the same place. Um, I have redacted some information um, around this quote because it's quite sensitive and I'm not comfortable sharing it in this video. But it was around uh, an unpleasant experience um, for this participant. And the reason that it stood out is this participant for every other week of the study has written beautiful crafted words and content. Everything's been spelled correctly and grammatically correct and it's been well spaced out and you know really nicely done and this looks different. And I'm not saying that in the way that spelling is or was important for this study, it wasn't. It's just that this looked very, very different and worrying for this student in this final week of the study. I used my mental health first aid training to check in with the student outside of the study and they are doing okay. Um, I'm happy with how I've handled it and I'm thankful for the support that I have from the people within paper that's helped me on this one. I'm not going to talk about the situation that this participant found themselves in, but it was deeply unpleasant um, and it made me necessary for me to signpost them to a university service. I'm not going to share any more. I don't feel comfortable sharing that without more context, um, which I don't have. So back to this slide. I wrote this slide um, probably last week, so it's exactly the same as it was, even though that previous slide has just been dropped in this week. But it's even more pertinent, right? And my question, my final question for this is, how do you encourage a student to ask for help before they're in crisis? I think this is probably one of the most important questions I've asked so far today. I talked a lot and I've said a lot. I want to make it clear on some things that I'm not saying as well. Um, I'm not mentioning any of the names of the universities uh, involved here. And I'm not saying that anyone that's watching this that is working at a university are or aren't doing anything here. I know that you'll be doing great work. My hope that this work, this presentation, this video has highlighted some things. I hope some things might be as you expected. I hope some things might have surprised you. I hope some things had been exactly what you imagined. And I hope some things have probably shocked you as well. I hope today has highlighted that you can learn an incredible amount and depth of information and data in a short amount of time with a fewer number of people if you have the opportunity to delve into the lives of, in this case, students. I know that you'll be doing a lot of good work at universities if you're watching this and working at a university. Can you do more? Possibly. So I'm going to end this section with our six um, takeaways. The first being starting university has been an overwhelming experience for all our students. The step from being at home and doing A-levels to freshers is seemingly bigger than any of them had expected. And each of them had assessments within the first six weeks. Second is health is a topic which converged on all themes. Its impact on a student's ability to perform academically and socialise is huge. Even when they are healthy, students are thinking about what techniques they need and use to stay healthy. And third is we know that services students have suggested they need do exist, but there's a disconnect between the university signposting and the student's knowledge. The fourth is this diary study has been an excellent method for understanding student experiences. It's, I think, proved cathartic for students, with each being very willing to share their experiences. The fifth is, we've used an open format to allow students to direct the study how they felt most appropriate and important to them, given into the insights that I've been sharing today. And then the last one is, finding the time to complete the study seems to have been easy for the students because of the flexibility that we've provided and that I've talked about. And this has been essential given the overwhelm that has come throughout this study. So penultimate section here, 
is how can we start acting on this? These are some tangible next steps for people working at a university. You could replace um, university with any other sector or industry if other people are watching this, but this is university specific for this video. A lot of what I've talked about here and the problems is solvable and things can be changed. I think it's solvable by signposting and content and I don't think it's huge transformation programs or anything like that. But it's really important we need to work with students and get them involved and get them involved often. This isn't a done once thing and that's it. We need to work with students. There is a way of doing this by doing research like this within a university. There is a common problem that services are designed without students or the people that use them more broadly. So we need to involve students. Let's find out what's going well and carry on doing that. But we need to embrace what's falling short and learn from mistakes. And user research and co-design really can make a massive difference on that. So if you wanted to run a study like this, paper can do that within your university. You would be assigned a researcher at paper and we'd give weekly updates to you and the team. I shared a slide earlier which had the post-its and the squiggle lines. That's a really nice safe place to join in with this kind of work and join the analysis. And we often find that people enjoy that and certainly people learn more if you can get hands-on into the data as well. We'd provide a report to share and promote within a university similar to this and we'd need to agree an area of work together. I just focus on something quite broad, which was someone starting the university, but we've got a whole list of stuff that we'd be interested in doing. Things like how students access mental health support or how students find a job in a final year. How do you find a new shared housing arrangement? How do you work while studying? And sadly, how do you report any kind of discrimination as well? A study like this wouldn't be bigger. It would involve up to 10 participants. And I hope today the inclusion and importance of incentives has come through and paper handles that. We need to make sure people, the students, are uh, paid fairly for their time and we handle all that. And then I've said weekly contact with participants probably should have been daily. And when I say contact, that obviously includes support as well. Co-design is also another thing that you can do. This is really nice where to work on a clearly defined problem and that problem could come from a research like in the previous slide, or it could be something that you already know about in your university. It's a really nice way to showcase user centered design principles that's often abbreviated to UCD. And we know that some universities are struggling to get this kind of new different ways of working embedded in. And this is a really nice, safe, small way of doing it. The work would be to design a testable prototype Prototype is quite a loose word. It could be um, some guidance, some signposting, some content. It could be a sketch of an end-to-end service. It could be anything. We need to decide that together. But it is a nice way of uh, opportunity for including leaders and stakeholders in your work. Maybe you've got a bit of resistance within university or a faculty or a team, and you want to involve people that see hands-on how this kind of research and design work happens. Co-design needs to be a little bit smaller, so we involve, involve up to five students. And we know how to do this with people that are often time poor. So we've got this down to two half day sessions and we can book these in at times that are good for you. Again, incentives are really important so that we reward students for their time and we handle all that. And again, we need to agree an area of work together. An ultimate slide um, before I get on to Q&A. So for everyone in the session and for people watching here, um, if any of this sounds interesting or if you'd like to have a chat, I'd encourage you to book in a 30 minute chat with me. You can do so on either the link or using the QR code. That link is bit.ly slash hey hyphen paper or use the QR code. And that will take you to a calendar booking tool called Calendly and you can book a slot. Final thing here. Um, is thank you so thank you if you've got to the end of watching this video i really appreciate it um i do want to say a special thank you to rachel cam and harry at paper for the time getting this presentation to where it is now i couldn't have done it without you so thank you i'm going to flip into um the q a's that have been listed so bear with me while i just move my screen around and hopefully this still works so 
in front of me, I've got a list of the questions that were asked on the session about an hour ago. I'm going to read them out, <clears throat> but I'm not going to include anyone's name. And I'm just going to answer them, hopefully, in the same way that I answered them on the session today. So I'm going to start with, uh, let me just make it a little bit bigger on my screen here. Uh, the first question that said, uh, if the turnaround was so quick, how did you ensure ethical clearance? So um, hopefully this came through on a slide that I was talking about. <clears throat> we do this work all the time. And the things that I think made a massive difference is um, our experience in conducting ethical research over the past eight years. The fact that we've worked with universities and gone through the ethics process and data governance process, we use that as a benchmark for this. And I mentioned about peer reviews, which we did on this project. I talked about um, being uh, really sensitive around uh, data governance and how we deal with um, data being a controller and joint controller of sensitive data. So all that combined, along with a lot of other things, um, hopefully has given you the confidence uh, if you were thinking the same question about how we dealt with ethical clearance. And just importantly, this is a paper commissioned project. This wasn't commissioned by a new university. Another question was, uh, were you able to include both traditional brick and mortar university students and those that opt to begin university on a remote learning basis, such as, but not limited to the open university? Um, this was bricks and mortar. Uh, university students, this didn't include anyone that was entirely remote. Um, that is a really interesting topic. Uh, I'd love to do that again. Um, so if someone at the Open University or other is interested in doing that, you should get in touch. But no, this was students that attended Bricks and Mortar. Um, I am interested in doing that as a follow up study. Um, Another question here was, it worries me that students are feeling assessment congestion so early in their first year. How many instances were there? Do other listeners hear this from students? Excuse me. So um, I answered this in two parts. The last part about do other listeners hear from this from students? Uh, I didn't answer because it was aimed at other people on the call. Um, but how many instances were there? Every single participant talked about this assessment congestion as it's worded here about worried about things stacking up so early on um and time after time after again and balancing that the percentage scores and stuff like that so frequent for this size of study um and yes it worries me too another question here was can we have these slides it would be great to discuss them with my team of academic mentors and hopefully uh, I said something like, I think I'm going to do a video rather than share the slides. I'm not going to share the slides because I think it needs um, the context that I provided around the slides. And I think that would be missing. So I'm hoping that this video does that. Thanks for that question. Um, this one says, a thought rather than question on the health section, the grouping on support when a student has a diagnosed health condition. I'm interested to know how far a university seeks to identify undiagnosed conditions, especially hidden ones such as neurodiversity and mental health conditions. Um, I don't think there is a question in there. Um, I too would be really interested to know how universities handle that. If you do and uh, want to share that, book in a chat, I'd love to hear more. This next one says accommodation choices for the second year so early on in the first year can be really problematic. Friendship groups, knowing the nice places, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and hopefully I echo the same words that I said on the call earlier. Yeah, um, I think it's really surprised some students. And, and I talked about layering, layer that with maybe an international student, layer that with not knowing an area, knowing that with different people and still getting to know it. It's, it problematic definitely and people worried about it and already worried about it just a few weeks into university um and this question said did any of the students reflect on any benefits or otherwise of completing their diary studies and yeah people did i mentioned the words i think people have found this cathartic and i genuinely believe that there's been um a nice conversation flow and i think people have appreciated time and space um, 
to write down and share their thoughts every single week. I'm not ignoring that I think they enjoyed being paid for doing that, but I do think it's proved cathartic. So yeah, um, that is the main reflection on that one. Uh, this question says, I think one of the main issues is how we distribute these kind of messages because the support is there, but the students get so information it becomes white noise. This is really, really good question or thought and, and it echoes what I said earlier. Um, the information is there, but that doesn't help students having to navigate through everything. Um, less is more often, it's a kind of phrase, right? Um, and I think students are really struggling with that. So yeah, um, how the messages are distributed and messages, we could have a broader conversation about content and whether written words are the right thing or whether it's a visual description or whether a video is the right thing. I'll leave that for another day, but yes, it is a problem. Um, this next question, I think we're about halfway for people keeping track. Um, we're all participants straight from A-levels. Did you invite mature students who have had time out of education? If so, how did they compare? Um, this was a split of people. Some uh, were straight from A-level and it also included mature students as well. Um, I don't think it's fair or right to talk about the comparison given the small volume of stuff, but, uh, but at a high level, this project included both yes and i think broadly people are saying the same thing this next one says this is more one of the comments not a question thing welcome the research focus was related to students at a point in time rather than a particular perspective or side of them any follow-up thoughts on that um i can't remember how i answered it and i think i'll say the same thing um cheers i'm, I'm glad that the, the specificity around when they were starting university is welcome. That's nice to hear. I'm really glad. Um, I'm happy that we focused on that. I've got loads of ideas floating around my head about the next thing, what might be beneficial next. Um, but yes, if if it wasn't a question, it was more a comment. I'm also glad that we focused on it at a set point in time. Uh, someone said they had to leave, so cheers, no worries. Um, Someone said, I think one of the things that I appreciate in this research process is that the team are all mental health first aiders, would like to see that in the HE ethics proposals when working with students and staff. Um, yeah, I think that's a good thing. Um, hopefully it's the description of how paper is as an organisation and what we think is really important, and what we treat as really important. Um, I'm glad I've had the training. It wasn't nice to having to use it, but also it's really important that I had to use it. Um, we're dealing with people, um, often possibly heading towards crisis and checking in with them and signposting them is really important. Um, and for anyone interested, I, was, I would strongly encourage you to look into mental health first day training. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I'm really grateful that Paper's done that for us all. Uh, another question here was, could the slides be made available? I think I've answered that again. I'm not going to provide access to the slides. Instead, I've done this video. Um, what will be nice, and next question, what will be nice if you get uptake from institutions to tackle further research and co-design is to share what has been consented to be shared and what can be shared between each university and make connections and differences between other institutions. It could spark areas of research and insights. Uh, and I think I answered this something along the lines of, yes, wouldn't that be lovely? Um, I think the consent process would be really tough, but I'm happy to try and tackle that um, challenge. I think it'd be a really nice thing to share information between universities wherever we can. So the things that are working well are shared and the things that aren't working well, but ideas on how to fix and solve that are also shared. Um, I'm up for being part of that. Uh, comment here, instead of the slides, write it up as a paper. And I think I said, sure, I'll have a go at that. Um, okay, I, I really I like this question that's coming up um, because it showed that people were taking note. So the question is, I'm a bit confused. You said it's only five students in the study, but one of them was participant number 17. So you only analyzed five student responses or you just enrolled five students, thanks. 
I'm really happy that this question got asked. Um, there were only five students in the study and I assigned them random numbers. I didn't want the first student to see P1 and think I'm the first person and that for influence or sway it. So I assigned random numbers that went beyond five. Um, but yeah, so random numbers, including over the number five, but only five people. And I'm really glad that someone spotted that and asked that question. Uh, sec another one here, did anything come up around scale of provision and programs the students follow? Thinking of how accessible can support be in a small, large cohort of students on a program and how institutions could deliver in different ways to adjust the scale. Um, I don't think I could answer this on the session. I think I'm still struggling with it here, to be honest, um, but I will do my best. Um, I don't think anything came around scale of provisional programs because there was a variety. And I don't think there was anything specific about small or large cohorts of students. Um, I don't think that was directed or came through the research that I've been talking about today. Um, I do think there's a lot here about how institutions can deliver different ways and adjust things. And I think it's it should be done regardless of scale, is what I think. If there's something that will impact just a few people, but it will make their lives easier, then we should do that, I think. Uh, another question here, which is, would you have any useful links to user-centered design resources? I'm going to follow that up on an email to everyone that attended the actual event, but I'm also going to include that list of resources on the description thing from this video. So look below and you should see that list of resources. Uh, next question is, finding the balance between ensuring students with SEND or disability the additional support needs are identifiable and not feeling othered is really difficult. Looking into offering more general quiet slots for enrollment and welcome activity that is sensitive to sensory needs and alleviating overwhelm has been a focus for us and something we're going to look at before the next welcome period. This can be marketed more broadly so it is accessible without having the need to specify certain criteria which may help. Part of this could be using bookable slots where students can choose to disclose. Um, and I think this is a really nice thing. I think it's lovely that someone felt comfortable sharing that. Um, and I really like this idea of a welcome period. I'd love to learn more. So if anybody knows about a welcome period or is the person asked that question, um, I'd love to know more about it. Um, I, I really liked reading this question. I can't think about how to answer it. I don't think there's anything to answer. I think it's more a comment. But the fact that people are thinking about how people might struggle and thinking about ways to make their lives easier um, is great. A uh, couple more left and then I'll, I'll finish. Someone said working with APP outreach teams could provide a link to pre-arrival support and comms. Also speaking to current students to ascertain what they wish they knew before they start with us is another avenue of co-creation we may explore to help develop the sessions available. Um, I, I don't know. I think this is the same person above and I don't know if they're interconnected, but it's the same sort of thing. To hear someone talking about co-creation to understand what students might need before something happens is lovely. So. Um, I wish you well with that work. Um, do reach out if we can help in any way. Um, this one says, just to add your slide video thoughts, I'd find a video more useful because hearing your thoughts and speaking through it is really valuable. Thank you. Um, hopefully this does that. Have you drawn any, have you drawn on any research literature to inform your interpretation of the results? <clears throat> um, no was the answer and this still my answer. Um, I haven't looked at any literature. What I've done is um, alongside the research, I've created the slides that I've been talking about today over the previous few weeks. And I've asked for feedback and I've done review sessions with um, people at universities, some universities to get some initial feedback. And I've done it that way rather than looking at literature reviews. Um, I could have done, possibly I should have done, but that wasn't the time that I had available. Uh, someone said here, uh, please feel free to book in a chat if you're interested in user-centered design resources so we can figure out what to share, which is relevant. Um, that was Cam who I worked with at the paper. So yeah, absolutely. I think future me would have looked at some resources and shared, but 
either way, if you're interested in this kind of work, book in a chat, have a friendly chat. Uh, someone said, in response to someone, I think this is how user-centered design versus academic research differs. There is less focus on literature reviews. And then a final question or comment is, thank you. This has been a really interesting session. So whoever shared that, thank you. That's really kind of you. OK, um, that's me done. Um, I think it's probably about an hour or something like that. So if you got to the end of it, thanks for watching. I hope that's been helpful, useful, and informative. Um, please do that. Use that link on screen or that QR code to book in some time with me if that would be helpful. Thanks for watching. Cheers.